We're going to hear the JH24 and the Burl side by side. The first thing I got to do is turn on a tape machine. That's how you turn on a tape machine. It is very important that you maintain your machine. Let me show you what I use to do that. To clean my pinch roller, I use this Athens Corporation pinch roller cleaner. This stuff is amazing. 91% alcohol. Not the 70%, 91% alcohol. And then just some simple cotton pads and some small Q-tips. And that'll keep your machine nice and clean. I'm going to show you how I clean my pinch roller. And the tape path does not look bad. But watch this. Take a little bit of this, just a tad bit. Don't need much. Look at that. Look at that. I use a lot of old original tape, so this is to be expected. We'll just let that dry for a second. So I always have some dust off air spray. I don't bring it close to the machine, I keep it away. I'm going to show you how I clean my tape path. And whenever you use spray around your machine, spray it away from your machine, not the direction of your machine couple little light mists all right you don't want it dripping you just want it on there and then I always start with the record head I bring it away from the machine and then I go over back in to the repro head bring it away from the machine and now I go to the erase head back into the race hut. The reason why I go out and then back in, magnetism. It's just a habit that I got into, demagnetizing the machine. You never go from one head to the other. You always bring it away and then back in. So I like to do that when I'm cleaning the heads too. And then I go to the roller guides, tape lifter, then I take a pad, again, spray it away, and then I go over the dancer arm, and then, without it being saturated, capstan roller. Nothing on there, it's all clean and good. Then I take my can of air, about a foot and a half from the machine, just a couple light air sprays, and that's how I clean my tape path. So here are my patch base, and the way I have them set up is all my preamps are normalized to Pro Tools input. So here are all my preamps on this top row here. And this bottom row here are all my AD Burl inputs into Pro Tools. Without patching anything, they're normalized to automatically go into Pro Tools. Because I record more to digital than I do to tape, so it makes sense that I have these normalized like that. Additionally, Pro Tools outputs are normalized to my console's inputs. So I don't have to patch anything in, it just automatically shows up on my board. If I want to use my JH24, I have to patch in. If I want to use my API summing mixer, I have to patch in. So right now I'm going to patch in some channels of the JH24. The top row are my outputs, the bottom row are my inputs. I have red and black patch cables here. Red I think of as record, black I think of as playback. So if I want to patch in an API 312 for kick drum in to track one of my tape machine, I put it in track one of my tape machine. Now, to be able to hear that track on my console, I have to take a patch cable and come out of track one in to channel one of my console and so on for how many channels that I'm going to use. Snare top, API 312 out into track three of my JH24, but I want to hear it. So I got to come output of my JH24 into channel three of my console. I could 
take that snare drum bottom and put it on any channel of my console, but I like to have everything in a row. Track 1 goes to channel 1. Track 5 goes to channel 5, and so on. And there I have 16 channels patched into my JH24. 16 preamps going into 16 tracks of my JH24. 16 playback tracks out of my JH24 into 16 channels of my console. This, my friends, is a test tone tape. I put it on a bigger reel because this is the short version and it comes on a smaller reel, but I wanted the weight to sort of be the same, so I transferred the test tone tape onto the bigger reel. I still have the smaller reel. I could always put it back on the original reel. This is a very important tape. You must have one of these if you have a JH24 because this is how you calibrate your machine. Let's spool the tape. I have this tails out. That's how I store my tape. A little lick. Never hurt anybody. This right here is your tape sensor. What this does is if the tape leaves the path of this sensor, it stops the machine off. I am going to show you how to do a simple calibration on the JH24. Do you see this area right here on this MCI console? What do you think this was meant for, this little area right here? I can tell you one thing, it wasn't meant for a keyboard and a mouse because they didn't even have computers back then. Yes. They use it for writing pads and storing stuff, but look at this. I believe MCI sized it perfectly to be able to fit their two inch tapes there. MCI sold consoles and tape machines. And this just fits tape perfectly. So, just wanted to show you guys that. Okay, so I am gonna return it to zero. And I'm going to show you how to calibrate the repro side of a JH24. It's pretty simple. Okay, so now we are at the beginning of the one kilohertz tone. I have the remote set to tape. That is repro. We are hearing the reproduction, the playback, not the record head, the playback head. So basically when you're calibrating a JH24, I think of it as two different calibrations. The record side and then the repro side but I do the repro side first. Let's hear what it sounds like. One kilohertz. That gets annoying fast, so I'm gonna turn it down. Right now I am watching and I'm seeing all these should be at zero because I am calibrating for 355 nanowebers at plus six. So I just need to end up at unity, zero. And I am a little bit above, it's pretty close. And I'm calibrating for 30 ips, 30 inches per second. With the JH24, you could calibrate for both. You could calibrate for 15 inches per second and 30 inches per second. The JH16, I believe you could only do one or the other. But the JH24, it's a later year. They evolved a little bit, and you could calibrate for 15 or 30 ips. So basically, here's the time. At 15 inches per second, you get approximately a half an hour of record time. At 30 inches per second, you get 15 minutes of record time, give or take. All right. Now, what's the difference in sound? I could tell you because I have recorded full albums of bands both ways. 30 inches per second has a more hi-fi sound and a better top end, I would say. 15 inches per second, it's that low end that you'll love about tape. It, it just, it's a solid low end and it sounds really good. Because I transfer in the Pro Tools and manipulate from there, like I basically record the tracks for the JH24. Once I get the drums, bass, guitars, and everything I want on here, and I transfer it to Pro Tools, I don't mind. If I'm recording a full album, I'll do 15 inches per second because I want more tape time, all right? 
And the reason why is because once I get it into Pro Tools, I'll get that high-end polish sound anyway. But that's basically the difference in my mind. A more finesse high-end for 30 inches per second and a really cool low-end for 15 inches per second. Every channel has four cards. This is the beautiful JH24. So basically, this you got a repro card, an output card, a record, and a bias card. The remote is in tape. I'm going to play a one kilohertz tone, and we are going to adjust the level pot across all eight channels. Let me zoom you in. So if you look here, since we're in tape, we are on the repro card. Once I set the remote to auto, we will adjust the cue. I'm going to press play and please pay attention to track one VU. And you'll see one kilohertz. that it's a little high. So I'm going to go to the level potentiometer and I'm going to dial it back down to zero. See that? Now I'll go down past zero and I'll come back up to zero. That's it. Track one's done. Let's do track two. It's a little high, just a little bit. Come back up to zero. Track three. Track four. All eight channels are at zero. See right here where it says level? I switch the auto locator to auto, and now I'm going to do the cue card level. About a full dB high on each. So, here we go. Back that down. Back that down. We are in auto. I adjusted the cue card, record cue level at one kilohertz tone. And if you look, we are at zero all the way across the board. Channel one through eight. So we just did the level. All right. Now I just got to a spot where I'm at the 10K tone. I'm in tape. So I'm going to play the 10K tone. We're going to see where our levels are at on here. And then we're going to come down here and we're going to go to the repro card right here. And we're done with the levels. We're not doing low, that's 15 ips. We're doing 30 ips right here. And 10K high right here. We're going to adjust this potentiometer, the very top one, to zero because we're calibrating for 10 kilohertz. All right? So let's do that right now. 10 kilohertz. All right, looks like one is definitely high jumping around up there. They're all a little bit. So I'm going to go up here to the very top pot. And I'm going to bring one down to zero. There we go. We're at zero. We're going to go to channel two. Down to zero. Track three. Really quick down the line. Track four. Now that we did the first eight channels of the repro card, I'm going to come over here on the remote. I'm going to go to auto. I'm going to come down here. And we are going to go to the cue card. We are going to play the 10K tone. And I'm going to adjust the 10K on the cue card. Here we go. 10 kilohertz. Number one looks pretty close. So we're going to go to high speed, high frequency. Channel 1, bring it down a little bit. Channel 2, same thing. Down a tad. 3, 4. It's all just a little flaky and high. 5 looks good. We'll go to 6.
So now we're gonna load up a roll of two inch tape. Quantity 499. Okay, so we got to a part in the tape where this is a band I recorded about a month or two back. And obviously, I recorded them at 15 ips because you could hear it sped up. Let's give this a listen. I'm going to flip it back to 15 ips. It's that easy. All you got to do is switch it back to low speed. And let's give these tracks a listen real quick. So it's very important when you are recording the tape to have what you call a track sheet. And these are the track sheets for all the bands I've recorded over the years. This is what it looks like. You basically got the instrument, what you're using for mic preamp, uh, mic and preamp, comp and EQ, some extra notes, and most importantly, what track on the tape machine, what instrument is recorded on. And then for the band next week coming in, they're going to start a fresh track sheet. I put the date, the session, how many inches per second we're recording at, when I dump it into Pro Tools, what kilohertz, 96, 24 bit. Very important to document well when you're recording the tape. Okay, so we're going to give these drums a listen. I muted out all the other instruments. We're just going to hear the drums off tape onto the board. There is no compression, no EQ. I don't have any of that on. Nothing dialed in on the board except for levels and panning. Here we go. If you want to hear more room, you turn up the room mics. I'm going to do that now. I'm going to play it and then I'll turn up the room mics. Last room, I'll turn down the room mics and then I'll mute them. Here we go. So that's drums off tape onto a board, and the way you're hearing it, the direct audio feed, is I'm just coming off the board's two mix straight into the Tascam DA3000. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to hear it except for on the microphone on the video camera, which is my iPhone. All right, so I want you to hear direct feed audio so you could actually have a chance with what goes on on YouTube and their compression and their filtering. It's better to do a direct feed than have it just captured by my iPhone. So that's how you're hearing it. So if that was your first time going through a repro calibration on a JH24, congratulations. It's really that simple. You just need to know the process and then do it for every track. Also, if you're interested in knowing further how to calibrate a JH24, let me know. I'll do specific videos on how to have a transport operate flawlessly. I have a very smooth transport and I could show you how to balance your supply and take up reel perfectly to where the supply is not pulling too hard, the take up reel isn't slugging back. I know how to do this because I learned my machine inside and out. And it's not that hard once you learn it. It'll make your session go so much smoother when you could just have a tape machine that's reliable that you don't have to worry about. Well, this is going to be a multi-part series because it's a lot to do in one day. So we'll consider this part one, and I promise part two won't be too far along. So if you want to see part two and hear the J24 and the burls, the difference between them, I'll record guitar, maybe a kick drum, some snare, a little bit of drums, and we'll compare directly the J24 and the burl mothership. Like and subscribe, hit the bell so that way you get the notification on the next video I load up. We're going to consider this part one. Stay tuned for part two. Thanks for watching. I appreciate you guys.